Principles of Finance with Excel Modeling, Copyright Lou Gaddis. Topic 4, Long-Term Financing and Capital Structure. There's good references in the <clears throat> Beninga textbook, Chapters 18, Evidence on Capital Structure. In this topic, we're going to understand the advantages and disadvantages of using cash, equity, and debt to finance an investment or finance the entire firm. We'll also explore if capital structure uh, can, be, can be used to increase the value of the firm. In other words, is there uh, an optimal capital structure? We'll also, uh, related to that topic, see if there's a simplified way of calculating WAC. And then as a bonus lecture, we'll talk a little bit about VBA loops. So first of all, you think about a firm that's trying to finance a large project. You know, it's going to build a new plan to acquire another firm. One thing they can use is cash. So the question is, why, does, why do firms hold so much cash and why don't they use more of their cash? So here's an example here. Here's an a, a article from 2015. And it showed that in 2015, Apple had about $160 billion of cash, uh, mostly sitting off uh, uh, or outside the U.S., and to put that in perspective, that's about the same amount of cash that the country of Mexico has in its foreign currency reserves. So the question is, why do so many firms have so much debt? So here are some theories on why firms hold debt. Number one, the one you'd actually think about, a transactional cash balance. So some businesses just have our cash businesses. There's inflows and outflows and there's cash registers. So you just need to have cash around uh, to make disbursements. And this is the one we generally would consider, consider working capital, right? It's cash needed in working capital. Number two, required compensating balances. Uh, sometimes a lender, say a bank, will give a firm a loan, but they'll require you to deposit some of the proceeds of the loan back to the bank. It's almost like a security deposit. Number three, sometimes firms hold cash because they're nervous about the future. They're not sure what's going to happen or what future needs they'll have in CapEx. Uh, or stock you know, stock repurchases in the future, so they're going to hold off to their hold off on their cash and not pay it as a dividend today. And the last reason would re be uh, avoidance of repatriation tax, and that's what this graph is about right here. This is just foreign. This is currency held outside the U.S. of U.S. Com based companies. So why would a company hold so much cash outside the U.S.? And the answer could be that maybe they're waiting for a tax holiday when corporations repatriate or bring cash. Uh, earnings back to the U.S. to be able to use to do things like pay dividends, it would have to pay uh, usually a very large pa uh, tax penalty, sometimes called the repatriation tax. And the threat of some uh, uh, politicians that someday they're going to create a tax holiday and maybe have a little 30-day, 60-day window to bring that cash back would make you want to hoard that cash and wait for that tax holiday. Or another reason could be that maybe the company is just waiting for a big capital expenditure in the future and so why bring the money back, get it taxed, and then send it back to build that new factory in China or build that or acquire that new firm in, in, in Asia or in Europe? So why don't we just hold it there in case we need it uh, for later? Now, in the first three lectures, I talked a lot about free cash flows to the firm. And I said that what we're going to account for in free cash flows to the firm is I only, only want to look at non-cash working capital. So what I am implicitly uh, I mean by using non-cash working capital is I assume that for most companies, this is not why they're holding cash. Therefore, it is not cash needed for just in the normal operations. So I'm not going to call it uh, working capital. So for that reason alone is why we use non-cash working capital and not just all of working capital, including cash. Well, let's talk about, the, again, so the firm may want to use cash to finance, say, a big project, but there's reasons why they may be required to hold tax or they want to hold, or are required to hold cash or want to hold cash. Well, let's talk about whether a firm would like to, say, issue more stock. So to finance a big purchase or uh, acquisition, they could just issue more shares. Now, the advantage is that when you use stock versus, say, using debt, you're going to uh, be less risky. Anytime you have less fixed expenses, Right? If you borrow money by issuing a bond or getting a loan, you're going to have fixed expenses. If you don't pay them, you go bankrupt. You get sued. So if you have no debt, you can't go bankrupt. Also, by using uh, no debt, you do, you also are going to have higher uh, net income because there's no interest expense. Now, disadvantages of, saying issuing stock. 
to, to finance a new project. Number one, ownership is diluted for the current shareholders. So every shareholder is worse off when that new share is issued for two reasons. One, any cash that's going to be paid out as a dividend will be spread over more shares. So you might have less profit through dividends. Also, every shareholder of the firm gets to vote on certain things. And if you issue more shares, the value of those votes go down. Next, some people consider a signal when a firm issues stock. It's a signal they believe their stock is overvalued, right? The only reason you want to sell something, in this case, selling more shares, the corporation selling more shares, is if you think maybe it's overvalued. You would never issue new stocks if you think your stock is too cheap. You're waiting for the stock to go up. So it might be a signal to investors that the stock is over, overvalued, so firms don't like to use it. Last reason, last disadvantage, our dividend payments are not tax deductible. Interest payments are. So all else equal, holding all other factors equal, I'd rather use pay a dividend than an in, uh, than a uh, interest expense. I'm sorry, I'd rather use an interest expense than a dividend because of the uh, tax advantage of interest. And I want to make a big note here. On the last slide, I talked about using cash as if it's not equity, but cash we consider uh, is an equity financing because if you think about it. Who owns the cash, right? The shareholders own all the assets of the firm, right? The, the bondholders have a claim on, on their promised cash flows and we got to pay off our suppliers, but that's at excess cash that is owned by the owners of the firm. Therefore, when you use cash, you are in some way using uh, equity financing. Let's talk about stock for a little bit, about stock issuance. So when a, a company is initially a private firm, all right, it's owned by say a partnership or a few people or maybe one person. At some point, the firm wants to make a, have a big expansion plan and they can't finance it with just a local bank and local investors. So what they say is that the company's gonna go public. It's gonna have an initial public offering. That means the company that was privately held and may be open to a few choice investors through partnerships and, and, and so on, uh, the company becomes public. The shares in the company become public. They're, they're, they're traded on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. And at that point, anyone can buy shares. Anyone can become an a, a owner of your firm. Now, in investment banks like Goldman Sachs help facilitate that issuance of equity and debt securities by advising pricing and marketing for the firm. And they usually get a hefty fee. Now, let's talk about private equity. All right, so you had this, you had this company that you maybe started in your basement, like a Michael Dell and Dell Computers, and at some point you want to raise capital and expand to be a global operation, you go public, and then at some point, uh, maybe uh, some investors see the value in your company so much that they want to own all of it. So someone can take control of your entire firm by buying all the shares outstanding. And at that point, they can take your company private again. We'll call that private equity. So they took a public company or maybe a private company, but they generally you think about taking a public company and they take it private. In other words, they own all the shares and then they, they delist the stock. It's no longer on the stock exchange and they might hold the stock for say a three or four year period and then try to sell the stock for more than what they bought it for. Related to this is, let's talk about another private equity investment. This is way before uh, that stage I talked about in private equity. This is the initial uh, initial investment stage. So you had an initial business idea and you're probably not even profitable yet. So you might get a venture capitalist, a VC, to give you some early stage financing. So this would be before the actual IPO. And then also just uh, related to these terms, some people call it LBO or leverage buyout. This is just the purchase of a firm, like a private equity purchase, that would be financed largely with debt. So it's kind of a riskier private equity investment. I just want to note here that there are the also hybrid securities. There are stocks that look like bonds and bonds that look like stocks. For example, there's a preferred stock, and that's a stock with a fixed dividend. So it kind of looks like a bond payment, but it never matures like a stock. And then you also have convertible bonds that have an interest coupon rate. However, at some point you can convert them into shares of stock at some ratio. So I just want to point that out. They're not a big source of financing for a firm, uh, but there are preferred stock and convertible bonds. So let's now talk about debt or either getting a bond, the firm issuing a bond or getting a loan to finance a project. What are the advantages of using debt? The number one thing is the interest tax shield. In other words, if you have a loan that pays $10 interest per year, all right, that's your pre-tax interest expense. 
However, that $10 interest expense, that's going to reduce the overall firm's earning before tax. And to say if the tax rate is 40%, that $10 is going to be a shield to the rest of the corporation's uh, profits. And therefore, it's going to create a $4 tax shield. And after tax, that $10 interest expense is only going to be worth it's going to be only cost you six dollars. So what we say is all expenses that are allowed to be deductible before computation of tax create tax shields. In this case, that ten dollar interest expense created a, a four dollar tax shield because it reduced our overall uh, payment uh, to the government by four by four dollars. Uh, if you're interested in this topic or want to learn more, take a look at my video I posted on tax shields. It's a seven minute video it talks about tax shields. Another advantage of debt, just as a shareholder of a corporation, and maybe I like to have uh, a fair amount of debt in my firm simply to encourage dip, discipline by management. You know, maybe, maybe management sees that uh, you're really profitable and maybe they, they spend a little more carelessly. So by having a little debt, they're a little more concerned about going bankrupt. So it might uh, force them to, to worry that there's a little uh, margin for error or waste. Lastly, another advantage that doesn't dilute ownership. Right? If you issue debt, you still preserve the ownership. You haven't invited, invited any more owners. Disadvantages of debt, lower net income because of those interest expenses. Also, another important one is once you go to the debt market and, and maybe get a bond or, or issue bonds or get a loan, you're going to constrain your future ability to get future borrowing. And what if uh, you, know, you, you load up some debt today because you realize you want to take the advantage, the tax advantage of... Uh, the interest tax or interest tax shield, but then next year a big opportunity comes up. You have the ability to buy one of your uh, rivals, your competitors at a real big discount. However, at that point, you're already tapped out. The lenders aren't going to give you any more money. So the idea is you like to keep some flexibility. And then lastly, the big disadvantage of using debt is the the risk of bankruptcy or any kind of uh, financial distress. Now bankruptcy is pretty obvious. We go through bankruptcy. Right? You have to go through court, which costs a lot of money through lawyers, and you're going to wind up selling off a lot of your assets at a discounted price. However, even if you're just close to bankruptcy but never enter in bankruptcy, there's going to be a lot of distress cost. So it could be employees that fear the company's going to go bankrupt might jump and leave the firm, and suppliers are no longer going to ex extend credit to you, and customers start leaving you because you don't feel like you're going to be able to service their products for a long time. So there's a lot of disadvantages of using debt. All right, now debt, I'm going to talk about loans, bank loans, simple bank loans like your car loan. And I'm going to then talk about bonds. So small and medium sized companies often use bank loans and not bonds. Now bank loans are often level payment, just like your, your, your car payment or mortgage might be, and which means that they amortize the principal uh, over the period of the entire loan. Now, each payment of the, uh, of the loan contains both interest and principal. And like I mentioned the other day, or the, the other slide, that interest expense creates a tax shield that the firm doesn't, it, it does make the payment of the interest and principal to the bank. However, it's going to save money in taxes. All right, let's take a look at an example of setting up how much a firm might actually pay for a, for a loan. So I'm going to go to the start file and we're going to set up this loan. Let's say that your firm borrowed $100,000, 5% APR, annual percentage rate. It's going to be a five-year loan and it makes four payments per year. So every three months it makes a payment. Now the first thing we have to figure out is what is the quarterly payment? Well, we can use our payment function in Excel. However, we got to adjust it. So let's go into, let's uh, click on my function uh, wizard there. And where it says rate, you can notice it's the interest rate per period for the loan. For example, 6% over four for quarterly payments at 6% APR. So what that means is whenever you have a payment, uh, a loan that's not annual payment, the rate has to be the periodic payment which is, in this case, 5% divided by 4. So in other words, you pay 5% per year, but you really pay 1.25% every 3 months. So I'm going to put that 5 over 4 here, 1.25%. Now the number of periods, 
is it's actually this this actually is not the number of periods if you read this it's the number of payments so this five-year bond that takes payments four times a year actually makes five times four payments 20 payments and the last thing there is I'll just put a negative sign and say I'm I'm gonna borrow a present value of hundred thousand dollars the only reason I put a negative there is so the, the number turns out to be positive so in this case that loan is going to cost me $5,682.04. That payment will ensure that I pay off all the principal in exactly 20 payments. And we can prove that and then calculate the after-tax cash flows. So let's talk about the after-tax cash flows. If you're this firm borrowing money, the first minute I enter into that loan, I get that $100,000. That's the only inflow you're ever going to get. Now we have to calculate what are the each payment, and then how much interest and principal are in each payment. And then based on that, we can calculate the after-tax cash flows. So I'm gonna make this a little larger. Let's say that our beginning balance for the first period is $100,000. Of that $100,000, you're gonna pay on the $100,000, 1.25%, which is 5% divided by four periods per year. In other words, 1.24% per year. I'm gonna anchor that. So that first, that first payment of $5,682 is going to include interest of $1,250. Now the total payment is five six eight two four cents there. I'm going to anchor that. If I subtract that, subtract the interest from that, that means of the $5,682 payment, $1,250 is interest, $4,432.04 is principal. Notice how I anchored the payment. Now here's my ending balance. Here's how much I owe the, owe the bank at the end of the first quarter. I started with $100,000. I paid $1,200 in interest, but what I paid, uh, paid in principal is $4,432. So my ending balance is $95,567. Then we can just continue this process. What's my beginning balance the next period? It's $95,000. Then I should be able to copy these formulas down and see the second payment was 1.25% of 95%. So the second payment contained 1,194 of interest. And notice the total payment's always 5,682, so I'm paying more principal back, which means my balance goes down. Now here's the magic of using the payment function, level payment loan. The level payment loan ensures that that last payment, $5,600, and our $5,611, if I calculate 1.25% of that, that's the interest component. And here's the magic. The principal component of the last payment is exactly how much you borrowed or how much is uh, left in the beginning balance. Therefore, the ending balance is zero. So in other words, this payment right here is calculated such that this schedule ensures that on the last payment, you exactly pay off your loan. Now, how much did this actually cost the firm? Now, your initial answer might be this, but it's going to be wrong. You might say, it might it cost me $5,600 a period. Well, that's close, but let's talk about why it's not right. You are going to pay $5,600, which is $4,400 in principal and $1,250 in interest. That principal is part of your payment. However, the interest payment is going to create a tax shield. So I'm going to take the interest payment minus the interest payment times one minus the tax rate of 40% for this firm. I'm going to anchor that. So it's not costing me 5682. It's going to cost me 5182. Let me just take the difference between those two numbers. I'll just, since one's a positive and one's a negative, I can add them together. There's a $500 difference. So let's talk about that for a minute. Again, check out my podcast on tax shields. So here's what's going on. The, the after-tax cash flow of this $5,682 payment is only $5,182. Let me explain. That means a check is written and paid in the amount of $5,682 to the bank. However, by having an interest expense of $1,250 flow down to earnings before tax, I'm going to reduce my tax taxable income by $1,250. Now, 40% of $1,250 is $500. So what's happening is that $1,250 of interest is creating a tax shield of $500. And that's the difference between the pre-tax and the post-tax cash flow here. And I can just copy this formula down as long as I anchored 
the the uh, tax rate. And what you see is I pay oh, about five thousand to six thousand dollars per period, but it actually changes each period because my tax shield is shrinking. I'm paying less and less tax and more and more principal. So that's a bank loan. Let's talk about uh, another a downside of, uh, of, of uh, uh, bank financing we haven't talked about, and that is when you sign a, a contract with a bank, a loan contract, they'll often have restrictions because the bank is worrying about you cheating them, right? So they want to make sure that you stick around and you make their payments. So what they can have is affirmative loan covenants and negative loan covenants. Affirmative means that you must do this. Uh, negative loan co covenants say you must not do this. So affirmative loan covenants examples might be you must maintain insurance on your property, general liability, and life insurance. You must have audited and reviewed financial statements and even personal tax returns delivered to the bank periodically. You must remain, uh, you know, say a current asset ratio or an asset test ratio of a certain value. If not, you're in trouble. You must maintain collateral or compensating balance. We talked about that on that cash slide. Or you must... Uh, any new loans must be subordinated to this bank loan. In other words, we get paid first. And they can be even worse. These, these banks could have other terms like there's no change or mergers without approval. There's no further loans or leases without approval. There's no distribution of profits like a dividend without approval. There's no sale or purchase of equipment without approval. Because what they're worried about is when times get bad and you owe a lot of money to the bank. Why not just sell off your assets and pay yourself a big dividend? Well, they understand that you can do that, so they want to restrict that. Now, a breach in any of these covenants that may be in your contract you know, would result in first kind of a nasty letter, caution, a caution letter. Could be default penalties, could be a higher interest rate, or they can say, hey, pay back my loan tomorrow. Now, businesses that want to avoid this, they could try to negotiate terms, but they better be ready to go to a new bank. So for these reasons, uh, uh, bank loans tend not to be that favorable for a large corporation. They don't want to deal with this. And also they can, use, they can issue bonds and maybe get a better interest rate. So let's talk about this firm that not, they're not going to borrow $100,000 from the bank and get these cash flows. What they're going to do is they're going to borrow $100,000, still five years. So still five years, $100,000. And they're still going to pay 5% like the last loan, but they're going to get a bond. Now, bond terms are typically, for large corporations, semi-annual payments. So there's two payments per year. In this case, the, the semi-annual interest payment is 2.5%, which is half my 5%. And let's keep the tax rate of 40%. So let's talk about this. That, that, that's called my face value, that $100,000. Again, my coupon value, and it makes two payments per year. Let's do the after-tax cash flows of this bond, $100,000, instead of the loan. So let's go back to my Excel, star file, bond. In this case, the first cash flow again is I'm going to get my $100,000. That's, that's the good part. However, let's see what happens here. My beginning balance is going to be $100,000. The interest payment is going to be the beginning balance times the periodic interest rate. It's 2.5% every six months. I'm going to anchor that. But here's the thing. For, for uh, bonds, there is no payment of principal. No payment of principal. So I, I just, I'll just leave that blank. So that means my ending balance is going to be 100000 minus any principal payment. The ending balance actually never changes. So I can put that back up here and calculate my interest every period and notice the interest never changes either so this bond principal never gets paid off except when you when that when the you send the last coupon payment of 2500 back to your bondholder that coupon payment you must also pay a hundred thousand dollars you got to pay back your principal and that's why this number goes to zero here. You paid off your principal, not every, a little bit every time. Remember in this one, the loan balance is going down every time because you're paying both principal and interest. But in this case, and you're paying this $5,600 every three months, 
In this case, you pay $5,000 a year or $2,500 every six months, but none of the principal goes away, so these are all interest payments. So let's see what the after-tax cash flows are. $2,500, but again, that's going to shield the company from paying taxes. So I'm going to take one minus the tax rate. So this is what my, and I'm going to subtract any principal payment. You can see there's none there. So my after-tax cash flows are much less if I use this bond. However, I got to make this big lump sum payment at the end of the bond. So this actually makes it good for the corporation. Lots of flexibility, get to use that 100K the hundred whole time, but then they got to pay it all back in a lump sum. So this is a bond, $100,000 bond versus a $100,000 uh, loan. And I just want to mention one other thing that one there's a there's a good reason why this bond and my example here might actually be set, be uh, give a better rate than an actual uh, a loan. So again, again, say this corporation goes to borrow money from a bank and they tell them five percent, but you might find, go to a bondholder and actually get less than five percent. And so why? Because bonds are traded. All right, they're traded by, by, by financial institutions. You can go to Bloomberg screen and look at the price of your bond that you currently own and you can buy it and sell it every day. So that liquidity, the ability to get rid of that bond and dump it when the company's looking poor, it is valuable. You know, banks are kind of stuck with the loan. Whereas a bond investor can be diversified across many bonds and also can uh, buy and sell it. So let's, let's take a look at this bond. What if that bond we just bought are we just the corporation just issued it to the first investor at $100,000. That's what they paid for it. However, let's assume that as soon as they uh, uh, sell the bond, some news came out about the industry that looks kind of bad. And after that first day, the bond price slips to $99,000. All right, that was a $100,000 bond, but the, just the supply and demand, right? The, the demand is now lower because people don't are, inter, are worried about that bond. So maybe you try to sell it to a new investor. You want to get out of it. Out of it. So you sell it to a new new investor at ninety nine thousand dollars. Now that new investor will still get all the coupon payments as long as they don't go bankrupt. So the question is, for the initial investor that paid a hundred thousand dollars, they're going to get five percent returns on a hundred thousand dollars. But the new investor, they're going to get the same coupon payments, five thousand dollars a year. But when they divide by the new investor, only paid ninety nine thousand dollars in this example. So they must get, be getting a higher rate of return, and that's called the yield maturity of the bond. What return would you get if you bought the bond at its market price, not just its par? Now, how we're going to do that in Excel to calculate the return for this bond is we're going to calculate its yield, or it's called yield maturity. Now, the Excel yield function, you say the day you bought it, the settlement date, the maturity date is the day the bond matures, so let's say five years from now. The annual coupon rate is the five percent. Frequency or the uh, the price. Now, now we have to we have to get price here. Now the price is going to be different here. I'm going to put in ninety nine, and we're going to go back to that redemption. Let's just always make that a hundred and hit enter. Whoops! Looks like I missed something. Oh, frequency. I missed my frequency there. And there's my 5.23%. So how do I get the price? Well, in the Excel function and in financial markets, you never quote the price of a bond as like, oh, this bond is selling for $99,000. You just quote it as a percent of par. So in other words, this bond had a par of $100,000 it was selling for $99,000. So if we take $99,000 over $100,000, it's selling for 99% of par. If we take that 99% and times 100, just to quote as a whole number, we say that bond is selling at 99. So that's the value I'm gonna use as the price for the Excel function. The price is always a number that's kind of close to 100, say between 80 and 120, because it's just a percentage of the par. And there you go. That's the yield maturity or the return that a bond investor will get if they buy that corporate bond at $99,000, even though it promises to pay $100,000 back later, and interest is computed based on that par.
Now this does this this sale of the bond for ninety nine thousand. It was just I'll mention that it doesn't affect the corporation at all. It's simply it's the selling of the bond from one investor to another. All right, last couple of things we want to talk about. First one is what if a, what if a firm wants to use debt? Does it use short term debt or long term debt? So it could borrow money for say a one year bond and then just renew the bonds every year for five years or can get a five year bond. Now there is some incentive. Here I'm going to launch the presentation here. There is some incentive for firms to issue short term debt and just keep replacing it. So again, the idea is a firm needs money for five years. It can get a one year bond at the end of the first year, it can get another one year bond and so on or just sign up for a five-year bond. Well, in general, yield curves are upward sloping. Both corporate and treasury yield bonds, yield, yield curves are upward sloping. What is a yield curve? It just simply is a visual, visual representation that five-year bonds have this rate, 10-year bonds have this rate, six-month bonds have this rate. So generally, we have an upward sloping yield curve, meaning the longer the term you want to bond, you know, you're going to pay a higher interest rate over the life of the bond. So you think there's big incentives with generally an upward sloping yield curve to borrow low. But the question is, why is there generally an upward sloping yield curve? And it could be recently the Fed's lowering short term interest rates to help the economy. That's that's certainly been true. However, these other factors, a longer term bond is riskier. You know, there's more time for the firm to go bankrupt. So it's a riskier bond. Also, longer term bonds. Um, have more liquidity risk. In other words, you're tying up your money for a longer period of time, uh, even though you could sell it. However, also, longer term bonds have more interest rate risk. And that means bond prices go up and down as, the, as interest rates change, and long term bond prices fluctuate more. So, for all those reasons, long term bonds are riskier, therefore, they have a higher premium. In other words, you have to offer a higher return. So you might think there's, there's incentive for firms to always borrow short and then just keep rolling the, 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 uh, the bonds over and getting new bonds or new loans. However, there's, uh, there's evidence to suggest that when you have an upward sloping yield curve, eventually short-term interest rates will go above the long-term rate. So yeah, I can get a good deal now. Uh, you know, I could, I could sign up uh, at this low rate now, but what this implies is maybe one year you know, interest rates five years from now, maybe are twice this level, all right? And then uh, there's an arbitrage argument that could say, well, on average, five one-year bonds will be the same interest payments as one five-year bond. However, the firm takes a lot of risk because they don't know what interest rates will be in the future. A few other uh, things I want to mention with bonds is bonds can have special terms to try to increase the overall appeal to investors. So you can make bonds that are senior secured, uh, senior unsecured, subordinated, or third-party guarantees. So what this says, it's, it's kind of giving the pecking order, pecking order. Some bonds will get paid before other bonds if the firm is in bankruptcy. So you might be able to appeal to different vet investors looking for different risks. You can have amortizing bonds. Just like the bank loan example we did, you can set up a bond which uh, some of the principals paid back every period, and maybe you'll get a better interest rate for so for some investors that are concerned about risk. You can have puttable bonds, in which puttable bonds are bonds in which at any point in time the investor may be able to, to uh, sell the bond back to the uh, initial to the firm at a, at a, a certain price, maybe par. And you can have callable bonds, kind of the opposite of a puttable bond. A callable bond is a bond which is the advantage is really to the issuer, the firm, and that they can always decide, hey, I know I gave you a bond that was supposed to pay you interest for 10 years, but after two years, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop paying you interest and give you your money back. So that would be a 10 no call two. In other words, a, it's a 10 year bond unless I call it, but I can call it after two years and just hand you your par back. Uh, related to this, uh, to debt, is it one alternative to debt is to get a lease. So let's think of an example of a firm that wants to buy a, a really expensive computer from IBM, like a mainframe network computer, you know, so a million dollar computer, but it doesn't have the money. It can't borrow the money, you know, it, for whatever reason, it can't borrow the money from a bank. What it can do is ask IBM to give it an operating lease or get a third, part, party, com, third party company to give an operating lease. And what that says is you give me the equipment for free and I promise to make fixed payments. 
All right, that's an alternative to uh, a, a debt financing. However, every capital lease has to be either a capital lease or an, will be uh, specified as an operating lease based on gap. If it's classified as an operating lease, it just looks like another expense, just like cost of goods sold, any OPEX, where it's going to be expense in the period just based on whatever the lease cost is. However, under any of these conditions here, a lease could be uh, classified by the accountants and by GAP as a capital lease. In that case, what they're saying is the firm is really entered into an obligation to buy this, uh, to make these payments that it can't get out of. Therefore, the present value of all those payments should count as, it will show up as debt on the balance sheet. And the imputed, you impute a charge based on that, and those lease payments come in as interest expense and not just operating expense. All right, so last couple of things we're going to talk about relative to my choice of when I had to finance a new project or in general as I'm financing the firm uh, from, from scratch. You know, do I use debt? Do I use equity? You know, do I use bonds? Do I use uh, 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 loans? Do I use short-term debt or long-term debt? Do I use some of those hybrid securities? So there's a, there's a, a literature talking about, uh, or academic literature, uh, talking about optimal capital structure. Is there an optimal mix of stocks and bonds and loans and short-term and long-term that can maximize the value of the firm? And how we think about that is the only way we're going to maximize the value of the firm based on the model I gave you is, uh, you know, we, we, we learned before is free cash flows of the firm are unaffected by these financing decisions. So you know, the only way to maximize the value of the firm based on financing is to minimize your WAC. So say if you use you know, no debt, you have a zero DDE ratio, zero DDE ratio, you might have this whack of say 8%. But if you have say a DDE ratio of, I don't know, 0. 0.5 or 0. 0.4 or 0. 0.3, you might get a whack of say 6%. So the idea is, is a firm that goes from no debt to a little bit of debt can maybe lower their whack and what presumably going on here is we're starting to take advantage of the government's uh, tax shield, the government's uh, allowance of interest as a, as a uh, allowable expense before taxes. However, at some point, the benefit, the tax benefits get outweighed by the possibilities of distress and bankruptcy. So the trick is finding that sweet spot. What minimizes my whack? In other words, maximizes my value of the firm. However, the, the evidence on finding the sweet spot is kind of depressing. And, uh, and a couple things uh, that are kind of depressing are studies show that managers aren't really, you know, they think of the, the CFO of the firm or the CEO of the firm, they don't really have much to say about their DDE ratio because most of the drivers of the DDE ratio are not the choices of instruments on a daily basis, but it's just the market gyrations of the stock market. Remember, DDE ratio is the market value of debt over the market value of the equity. The market value of the equity are the shares times the price of the stock. That daily up and down of the stock is really what's driving DDE ratios. So it's really not even the, under the firm's control. Also, there's other studies that show that leverage doesn't affect firm whack. So you look in an individual uh, industry and show that firms with high debt and low debt have about the same whack. So what does that mean? That means that maybe the tax benefits are always perfectly offset by those additional costs, you know, those distress costs. And also that implies that the choice of, of DE and debt versus equity securities really doesn't affect WAC at all. So what are the implications of this depressing evidence for the corporate finance manager? The implications are, uh, one, the WAC of a firm can be measured a simpler way, and that is, why worry about my DDE ratio and calculate a WAC when the evidence shows that DDE ratio has no effect on WAC? So why don't we just use an unlevered beta, assume no debt financing in the firm, and just plug in the CAPM formula. And we'll call that WAC because adding debt shouldn't have any effect based on the evidence. And what really should, uh, I think, is a, a good advice is maybe don't spend that much time thinking about WAC when you're trying to evaluate uh, the value of a firm or value projects, which we're going to do shortly. 
what you should really focus in is on the cash flows and not the WAC. So if I had you know a full week to dedicate to to value a firm, I'm going to spend maybe a little more time uh, on cash flows than I am on WAC. So I went back and looked at Whimsical and Walmart's WAX. This is the WAC we did in topic three. By, by getting the book value of debt and the market value of equity and the tax rate. And I looked at the cost of debt and I looked at the equity percent and the debt percent. So I got their DDE ratio and unlevered and relevered their betas. I did all that work and I got 12.66%. But you know what? What if debt doesn't matter? If debt doesn't matter in relation to WAC as some of the evidence suggests, maybe I should just take the unlevered beta for the industry and just take the risk-free rate plus that unlevered beta times the market risk premium. And I get 13.09. It's not clear that 13.09 is any worse than 12.66. So that's an alternative and a simpler alternative to calculating the whack of a firm. Just assume they have no debt. And I did the same thing for Walmart. You know, after all the pain we, got to, we went through to get 6.69 by looking again at the at the uh, at Walmart's unlevered beta and their debt values and their DDE ratios and tax rates. What if I just took the risk-free rate plus their unlevered beta times market risk premium? That would be the whack of the firm if they had no debt. 669, maybe that's close enough. So in this topic, we talked about the advantages of using cash, equity, and debt to finance a firm and explored if capital structure can increase the value of the firm. And I also presented a simplified WAC alternative, and that is just use KE equals WAC. In other words, just assume the firm has no debt, and I'll just use the risk-free rate plus an unlevered beta times the market risk premium. So let's, let me give you a, a little bonus lecture on VBA loops that's related to bonds. So here's the bonus lecture. Uh, loops uh, are, are, are programming programming statements that are used in VBA and they're used to uh, repeatedly do a, an, an operation or, or repeatedly use lines of code and they're one of the most powerful and most common programming tools. I'm going to show you a really powerful tool that's in VBA. It's called a for loop. Now a for loop is always going to be in this format. Again, we're going to have some kind of function name up here with some parameters and we're going to say n function down here, right? But in somewhere in the program, we might, we're going to have some, some code that says the word for have some counter, some variable equal to some variable, start variable to end. So we're going to have some counter go from start to end. It's going to make more sense in a minute. We're going to have some statements in the middle get repeated. And we're going to have the word next and just have some counter. All right, let's make more sense here. Let's take a look at this uh, simple example. I want to value a five-year bond that makes annual coupon payments. So the annual coupon rate is 5%. Let's assume a par of $100 and it's going to mature in five years and the discount rate is 10%. All right, that's my discount rate. So let me talk about the cash flows of this five-year annual coupon, 5%, $100 par bond. It's going to pay back a hundred dollar. It's going to pay. I'm sorry. It's going to pay back the, uh, or it's going to make interest payments or coupon payments of five dollars, five dollars, five dollars, five dollars, five dollars. Also, in year five, it also makes a payment of a hundred. So that last payment is one hundred five. So that should look familiar for an annual payment, five percent, hundred dollar par bond. If I take the present value of all expected cash flows to value the bond, five dollars divided by my discount rate of 10% is worth 455. $5 over 1.1 squared is 413. $5 divided by 4.1 cubed is 376 and so on. And the present value of the last, coup, uh, the last par payment will be $100 over 1.1 to the fifth. So this is the present value of all the cash flows of the bond. I sum it up and I get the present value of the bond, or in other words, it's fundamental price or intrinsic value or it's present value. Now that's kind of a pain 
to actually do this, right? You have to set up a big spreadsheet and what if we're a, a 20 year bond with annual pay, or uh, monthly payments? I'm gonna create a function called bond val. That's the, that's, I don't write the word function. I'm gonna start every function with the word function. I'm gonna give it the name bond val. And I'm gonna say bond val has four parameters. Coupon rate, par, t, and r. I put some comment lines, lines here. CR is the annual coupon rate. PAR is the final payment and used to compute coupons. R is the annual discount rate and T is the maturity in years. Here's my end function. So we got function and function. That defines the beginning and end of a function. So four lines of code are really going to value any bond from say one year to a million years. And let's look at the code. We're going to have our for loop, right? Here's what our for loop looks like. The for loop always looks like this. For and a next and in between the statement that's repeated. So I'm gonna create a new variable called i in this program. And that i is simply gonna be something we call a count. I'm gonna call it a counter. It's just gonna count for me and you're gonna see that in a minute. It's just gonna count. I'm gonna say for i equal one to t. Now, where does the t come from? Well, when I insert this function, I'm gonna tell it that t is equal to five. I'm sorry, this five, <laughs> t is equal to five. It's a five-year bond. So I'm gonna create some variable called i and start it at the value of one and increase it to the value of five, changing by one. So this variable i is gonna be equal to one, then two, then three, then four, then five. So let's, as the program runs, it does this statement here, goes to the for statement for i equal one to t. It's gonna set i equal to one initially. So now i is currently equal to one in this program. All right, so i is currently equal to one in the program. And here's where all the action's happening, right? The function's called bond val. Bond val equals bond val. All right, well, what's in bond val? Well, Bond val, I didn't put anything in it. So bond val is equal to zero. So it says bond val is equal to bond val, which whatever zero is, or it has zero, plus the coupon rate times par. That's my $5, right? That's 5% times 100. Because when I insert this function, I'm gonna use these parameters. So it's gonna be $5 over one plus r to the one power. So, so when it's gonna, it's gonna set i equal to one and say bond val equal to zero plus $5 over 1.1 to the one. So what's gonna wind, bond val is gonna have the value of $4.55 at this point in the program. Next i, whenever it gets to a next statement, it kicks it back up to the for statement and increments the i by one. So now i is equal to two. Bond val, it's gonna next execute the line in between. Bond val equals bond val. Now remember, what's in bond val? Bond val now has $4.55 in it. So bond val equals $4.55 plus $5 over 1.1 squared, which is 413, all right? So four, uh, five, uh, five over 1.1 squared is 413. So it's gonna take bond val 455, add 413 to it. Now bond val has 868 in it. Next i, it's gonna go back to the statement, set i equal to three. Bond val equals bond val. Well, bond val has 868 in it. So it's gonna to add to it the present value of the third payment, 376. So now bond val has 1243. Next i, it's gonna set it equal to four. It's gonna add the next present value. Bond val now equals 15. Next i, bond val equals five. You know, for i equal one to t. So it now has reached the value of t, five. That's the ending value. So it's gonna do the statement one last time. Bond val equals bond val. At this point, it has 1585 in it. It's gonna add the present value of the last payment and get to 1895. Now bond val has 1895. It's now gonna skip the next statement because it already completed one, two, three, four, five loops. 
So I'm going to go to the next line of code. Now notice bond val equals bond val plus. So in other words, bond val equals 1895 plus, well, par, $100 over 1 plus the interest rate in this case, re owed to the T, not the I, the T. So the last thing it's going to do is take the present value of the par payment. 6209 and add it to bond val. Bond val now has 8105 in it and the program is done. The program is value to bond. So let's go to let's go to Excel and let's uh, take a look at the program how it runs. So here's the program. I'm going to copy the program here. Control C. I'm going to go to my VBA I'm going to see if I have a module. There's no module there, so I'm going to insert my module. I'm going to paste it. So this is my module one. If I look up here, this is my start file, Excel file. Now I can insert the function right here. I can just say insert function, drop down menu, user to find. I'm going to click down here. I see bond val, enter. I'm going to put in my coupon rate, par, T, and R. And there's my 8104. So in other words, this program, when it runs, it's going to put in the way I've implemented it here, way I've inserted. Coupon rate is going to pick up 5, par is going to pick up 100, T is going to be 5, and R is going to be 10%. Now the advantage of using a function in this case, now it becomes really obvious. What if you want to value a 100-year bond? That's the present value of a 100-year bond. So in this example, we have computed, or in this example, we created a program called BondVal that can value any bond from say one year to a million years. And it does it just as quickly. It doesn't, you don't have to set up all this spreadsheet space. It does it by creating a, a looping structure where it creates this counter I. It sets it from equal to one to the maturity of the bond. So in this case, it sets I to one, executes the statement, sets it to two, executes the statement, three, four, five, then it's done, and then comes down to the final value, the final uh, programming line. Now let me just talk one minute about what uh, this bond value equals bond value plus, and let me explain what's happening there. I'm just kind of doing some erasing here. All right, so what's, why, what would I, why would I have to do bond value equals bond value plus? Why don't I just take this out of the program? If I take this out of the program, what's happening is BondVal is always replacing or putting a new value in to this variable called BondVal. So the program is always putting a new variable into the BondVal. So if I take and, and not adding to it, so if I just were, you can, you can practice this, just delete this from your program and rerun it. And what you'll get is what's going to happen to BondVal is the first time it runs the loop, it'll put 455 in BondVal. The second time you run the loop without this statement here, it's going to just replace it with 413. The third time it runs the loop, it's going to replace it with 376. The fourth time it runs the loop, it's going to replace it with 342. The fifth time, let's replace it with 310. And then here, it's going to replace it with 6209. So the function will return 6209. So, so what's the trick? By saying a function name, a variable name, is equal to a variable name plus, by making these identical, it just keeps adding to itself. So this is the basic, really powerful code that you can use with a loop that makes an aggregation. It doesn't just replace values in this function called bondval or this variable name called bondval. It keeps adding to it. All right, so this is one of the most powerful uh, 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 series of code you can have in financial markets. 
you know, if you think about all financial instruments are just the sum of the present values of all their cash flows, this is the basic code that can be used to value any financial instrument because you just keep adding together all the present values of the cash flows across time.